point of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 11008 in the name of Stuart Stevenson on the importance of school bus safety around Scotland. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak button now. And I call on Stuart Stevenson to open the debate. Seven minutes, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And tonight we're joined by my constituent, uh, Ron Beatty of Gamery. He is far from unique in believing that we owe a duty to protect our vulnerable and inexperienced young folk. But following the permanent disablement of his granddaughter in an accident in the vicinity of a school bus, he's been a ferocious champion of improving safety in our school transport system. I've not been alone in supporting Ron, members of the Public Petitions Committee, of all part, political parties and of none have supported his efforts uh, to improve public policy and practice. This evening's debate is an opportunity to revisit the issue, look at what has been achieved thus far and importantly discuss what we now expect. First, this is not an issue for the Beattie family simply and for the pain they've suffered. It's not an issue for the North East of Scotland alone where we've seen too many accidents involving school students mounting or leaving school buses. It's an issue for all of Scotland, both rural and urban. Let's be clear, about two-thirds of a million pupils make their way to about 2,700 schools each day. A goodly number of those use the bus. Youngsters are not naturally born with adequate appreciation of all the risks they will meet in life. Motorised transport in particular uh, presents challenges. Assessing the speed of approaching traffic, deciding whether it's safe to step onto a road, these are not skills we're born with. Buses add a further complication. They're big and they're likely to obstruct one's view of the road. Education authorities and bus operators working with them to transport school Students are acutely aware of the need to protect their passengers, and other road users also have a road role to play. This debate, and hopefully the commentary around it, will help to remind us all of the need to exercise care near school buses, especially when they're stationary. So what can be done to help alert the driver? Good, clear signage that the bus is a school bus. And crucially, its removal when it's not operating as a school bus. Our brains are alerted by changes in the environment, the psychological phenomenon of ennui, what we see all the time, we no longer notice. So buses must look different when they are carrying school students, and only then. Flashing lights on the bus to break into drivers' attention. Speed limits, which can vary throughout the day, and lights to alert drivers to the need for reduced speed. Something we already do outside many schools, the length and breadth of the country. In Aberdeenshire, in Aberdeen and in Murray, we've seen a number of steps taken to improve safety. And Transport Scotland, I will say Mr Beattie is not their greatest fan, um, has produced guidance for our 32 local authorities on how they can help improve road transport safety. See Me technology has been trialled in Aberdeenshire. It causes flashing lights to switch on at bus stops as they detect people who are approaching the stop who are carrying a transponder. And after it was established, there was no legal impediment to do so. Much larger school bus signage has been used. And Aberdeenshire Council has made a condition of bus contracts that the signage comes off when the bus ain't carrying school students. So progress has been made. Lots of good things done by people of good heart. I will indeed. I'm very grateful to Stuart Stevenson both for taking the intervention and for bringing this important issue to the Chamber. He's right to point to this being an issue across the country uh, and one of the most tenacious uh, campaigners on this issue in my own constituency, Councillor Andrew Drever, has been putting forward the suggestion of a, a ban on overtaking of stationary school bus and I wonder whether that's something that uh, he's been aware of as a, as a campaign strategy and what his views are on the efficacy of that. Thank you Mr MacArthur. Mr Stevenson. Um, 
I wasn't aware specifically of Councillor Andrew Drever's initiative on that, although I've heard it in other places, and it certainly is something worth considering. It's not, of course, within our gift in this Parliament to legislate to do that, but I will return to the subject with another suggestion that might have that effect uh, a little later in my, uh, in my remarks. With a greater focus uh, on school transport safety in the North East in particular, uh, we've not seen a repeat of the string of very serious injuries that we had a few years ago. Policy and practice changes may have contributed, or the very bad winters which closed down schools, and therefore school transport, and the comparatively mild winters that reduced weather risks may have been a significant factor. Either way, the questions are, is there more we can reasonably do, and do we know what to do? And the answer to both really ought to be yes. Perhaps the most important thing that the North East experience does say to the rest of Scotland is that the costs of addressing the issue are between nil and trivial. It just takes an increased focus on the issue. So we can and must do more. But what should we do? Put requirements into school bus contracts, not necessarily the existing contracts. It always costs a lot to change one that you've got, but certainly new ones, which tend to be in a three-year cycle. Make contractors provide better signage, not behind the school window, but outside the, uh, the bus window, but outside the bus. Use it responsibly. Get the drivers using constant headlights when running and flashers when stopped. Do risk assessments and introduce 20 mile an hour speed limits where it will help. Look again at school travel plans, work with parents on bus routing, perhaps to arrange for pick-up and drop-off points to be at safer locations, and perhaps in the morning and the evening for individual kids at different places, uh, because the bus may be coming in a different direction. When I spoke in Alec Neal's debate on school bus safety in November 2006, uh, whatever else we can say, it's not really a new issue. I suggested we could use bus signage that looked as if it were making a legal statement to other road users. A big sign on the back of the bus saying, don't break the law on line one, and on line three, don't overtake the school bus. And on line two, the word please, in incredibly small print, might give the effect of a legal request without the necessity of legislation. So you never know. Let's try and think of a few tricks that grab attention and make things happen. Let's innovate. But let me close, presiding officer, by congratulating Ron Beatty for his tenaciousness in keeping this issue alive. But let's make sure the actions of our government and our council mean that we are keeping youngsters alive so that Ron's issue doesn't need to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Stevenson. We now move to open debate. Can I ask members to have speeches of no more than four minutes? Maureen Watt, followed by Alec Rowley. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I too congratulate Stuart Stevenson in securing this debate and specifically in relation to recognising the tireless work Ron Beatty has done on school bus safety following the tragic accident involving his granddaughter Erin. Road safety and accidents involving school children has been a particular focus of mine, uh, even when I was a councillor in Grampian Region, and I was proud to have managed to get one particular rat run which commuters used through my ward blocked off, which definitely reduced road accidents in uh, that road and adjoining roads. So I was happy when I came here to support Ron Beatty's campaign, particularly when there was a... A, a, a bad accident, uh, school bus accident on the Netherley Road, which uh, lies between my home and uh, my work. And when I saw Stuart Stevenson's motion, I thought that rings a bell. And I remember that I had a similar members debate on the 8th of February 2007. That debate was more specifically about the provision of seat belts on school buses. Um, only vehicles first used after 2001 were required to have seat belts fitted, um, and the legislation uh, still rested uh, with Westminster, and that was the main focus of the debate. In fact, the, the legislation was in the hands of Douglas Alexander, the then Transport mi um, Minister. Uh, rightly at that time, I got an email from Ron Beatty gently reminding me that there was more to school bus safety than seat belts. And I quote him, I quote his email, 
Yes, belts are vital to safety, as are improved bus visibility, modern visibility, flashing signage, the removal of the sign when children are not aboard at, at the time, uh, and you will see buses uh, on outings with this sign still displayed, which makes a total nonsense of its use. Dedicated school transport, extra flashing lights, more visible than hazard lights, many, you, many of us use when popping into the local shop. So please don't just stop at seat belts. It's the cheapest option. So that was me told then. Mr Beattie has, of course, kept up his campaign with petitions uh, considered by the petitions committee. And I note that progress has been made, albeit slow. And... Um, this in no way has yet met Mr Beattie's uh, ambitions. It would uh, seem uh, that we still await the transfer of this power from Westminster, and uh, I look forward to hear what the Minister says, but I hope it will be transferred before uh, the general election. Uh, the time it has taken to do this is not a good portent of the transfer of um, many much more uh, substantial powers. But much has been done, as Stuart Stevenson has mentioned. He mentioned that Aberdeenshire Council has conducted various dis demonstrations and trials. Uh, and on top of the ones mentioned by Mr Stephen, that has produced a bus stop education pact, including, uh, uh, which, and also including operators' um, induction training. And as has been mentioned, councils have great opportunities in the way that they frame school bus contracts in what um, they can and can't uh, do and what they require of, of people. And also, uh, as others, have, as Mr Stevenson has mentioned, the behaviour both of school children and parents should always be at the top of both uh, agenda. And I congratulate Mr Stevenson again on this motion. Thank you, Alex Rowley, followed by Mary Scanlon. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I would also congratulate uh, Stuart Stevenson on securing this debate this evening um, and acknowledge uh, the role that Ron Beattie has played in keeping this issue high. I know that when, when um, parents in, in Kingsey and Fife um, had a major issue around school safety in the bus. They were able to go onto websites and look at what was happening in the North East and get advice and speak to people. And that helped them achieve the campaign that they run at that particular time. Um, I do have some concerns in terms of the pressures that are on local government at the present time. And I know that as a former council leader, um, one of the, the options that was often put to me by council officials was to go to the statutory limits in terms of school buses. And I know that some local authorities have done that. And I do worry, particularly in these winter months, um, if we were to do that in Fife, for example, my home village of Kelty, a lot of the kids there would be expected to walk to Cowden Beath to Beath High School because it would be within the statutory limit. So I do worry about the pressures that are on local authority budgets and school transport often seems to be an easy option when officials are looking at ways of saving money. And I, I certainly wanted to come along tonight and flag that up. Um, on a more positive uh, note, I do know that in Fife there's a lot of good work going on within the schools themselves. Um, I was recently approached by a volunteer driver who pointed out to me um, that, that some of the minibuses that were being hired in um, to, for, for, for kids to go on trips, etc., there was no signage in them. And I know that I took that with Fife Council, and I've been assured that that has been addressed. Um, the role of the police and community safety partnerships is also very important, particularly where you're looking at uh, primary school transport. And I would say that we do need to continually to highlight, I think, the, 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 the new trend that, that parents um, tend to try and get their cars as close to the schools as possible. And that can create a hazard. It can create a hazard for kids coming off buses, and it can create a hazard around the school itself. I often joke that, that some parents, I think, if they could get the car into the playground, they would actually do so. And it's important that, that Police Scotland community safety partnerships and the schools themselves continue to look at that. 
Um, school, we, we, we send our kids, our grandkids out to school in the morning and we want to know that they're safe. We want to know they're safe in the schools, but we want to know they're safe getting to the schools. And that's why I commend um, Stuart Stevenson for bringing this debate here tonight and we need to continue to be vigilant and ensure that the kind of pressures that is on local government right now do not result in any compromise in school transport. Mary Scanlon, followed by Alice McInnes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I also welcome the opportunity to discuss this motion today and, like others, congratulate Ron Beatty uh, for his efforts in campaigning on the issue for many years. It often takes an impassioned constituent to raise issues uh, uh, in the Petitions Committee and it's a mark of the success of this Parliament that it can go from petitions through to the floor of this chamber. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Stuart Stevenson for bringing forward this issue for debate. It was back in October 2005 that petition PE892 was presented to the Parliament by Mr Beatty, calling for the then Scottish Executive to set down minimum safety standards for school bus provision. And uh, as Stuart Stevenson was speaking, it reminded me of uh, a friend of mine at school who ran out from behind the school bus and was in fact killed at Hillside Primary School, Montrose, many years ago. Um, but the petition moved between the Petitions Committee and the Education Committee and there have been two further reports in 2010 and 13. but we're still in the position today where, as the motion states, more has to be done on school bus safety. The Transport Scotland report in 2010 identified 10 ways to improve school transport safety, some of which have been uh, mentioned by Stuart Stevenson, but these include reducing speeds on school routes and around schools, encouraging motorists to reduce their speeds when passing stationary school buses, setting minimum safety standards in school transport contracts and risk assessing school drop-off and pick-up areas. Uh, the Minister for Transport, in his foreword to that document, said, and I quote, I believe that this guide will be invaluable for local authorities and operators as a reference point for their responsibilities in terms of school transport and will provide local authorities with a toolkit of measures that they could consider <coughs> in seeking to implement best practice. Unfortunately, three years on, when Transport Scotland reviewed the success of this document, their conclusions were disappointing. Some council respondents who were spoken to had never even heard of the 2010 study, let alone its recommendations. Some councils said it was because school transport could lie with education, transportation or engineering departments and there was often confusion within councils over who should take the lead. Uh, this is exacerbated when there is a shared responsibility which diffuses the responsibility even further. And as I said, uh, one of the most critical conclusions was that some local authorities had never even seen the 2010 report. But that is not to say that school bus safety is not considered an important issue in these council areas, but surely school bus safety should be the same in Shetland, Shettleston, Elgin and Edinburgh. And the 2010 report and Mr Beatty's petition both sought consistency of approach across Scotland. But when there are recommendations of best practice and advice on how to optimise school transport safety, it is disappointing that so little progress has been made since Ron Beatty began his campaign almost a decade ago. I did look at the transportation policies of each of the councils in the Highlands and Islands region, and to be fair, it's quite difficult to decipher whether they have implemented all or even some of the recommendations of the 2010 report. So, presiding officer, I hope in summing up that the Transport Minister uh, can reflect on his comments in the 2010 report, which we, we welcome, and suggest how the Scottish Government and local councils can work together to further improve safety on our school buses in order, as other speakers have said, to protect school pupils' safety across Scotland. Thank you. Alice McInnes, followed by Christian Allard. 
Thank you very much. And I too am grateful to Stuart Stevenson for bringing forward this important issue tonight. And I'm pleased to record my own gratitude for the tireless work of my constituent, Ron Beattie. Alongside others touched by similar personal tragedies in my own North East region, he has fought for a decade for safety improvements on school transport. And together they have determined determinedly turned traumatic events into a positive, substantive campaign for change. That commitment and contribution of our campaigners must be matched by the relevant authorities, and I hope the Minister will explain how the Scottish Government intends to encourage compliance with the 2010 Transport Guidance, if there is indeed a disparate approach across the country. It is worth highlighting the groundbreaking work of Aberdeenshire Council in this area in proactively developing safety measures. Because tragically, it was two fatalities within two weeks in 2008 that in part led to their adoption. 15-year-old uh, Robin Oldham and 12-year-old Alexander Milne were both knocked down, having just got off a school bus. In consultation with the Department for Transport, the Council trialled the revised larger school bus signage, and that included the words school bus, the chevrons, and utilised the high visibility material. And the results were overwhelmingly positive. Only 40% of motorists surveyed could correctly identify the statutory signage, but 80% understood the enhanced model. And indeed, all the findings indicated it was more effective, comprehensible and visible. And the Council has since rolled it out across all of its services, and they've covered the initial costs of that. The Council also has two surveyors whose prime purpose is to monitor contract compliance and safety across the school transport network. That's some 174 schools and 700 contracts. And non-compliance, such as the failure to appropriately display the signs, results in penalties against the contract. And elsewhere, as, as Maureen Watt has indicated, it's piloted the interactive school bus stop technology and the bus stop education packs. Um, more crucially, it has required the provision of seatbelts in all home to school transport services since 2010. Belting up in a car has been second nature since it became law in 1983. And we know that wearing a seatbelt can dramatically reduce the risk of serious injury or death. And so I'm surprised 40 years later it isn't yet compulsory on buses. I welcomed the announcement in March that the UK government will transfer to us the powers so that we can make it mandatory for buses dedicated to taking children to and from school to provide seatbelts. I'd be grateful again if the Minister could provide an update on its plans and the reasons why, if the reports are correct, this won't be phased in until 2018. My colleague Sir Malcolm Bruce also highlighted further options while seeking to introduce a new road traffic offence to prevent the overtaking of school buses, uh, which my colleague um, referred to uh, earlier when children are boarding or alighting. And Malcolm Bruce told this Parliament's Petitions Committee in December 2009 of the benefits of standardising seatbelt types, flashing signage and the requirement to remove school bus signs when they aren't operating as such. When parents entrust their children to, each other, to, to others each morning, whether it's at the school gates or the bus stop, they rightly expect them to be safe and secure. There is a duty of care, and it must not take further accidents to focus minds on better protecting children during the school run. There is much more to be done, but as everyone else has said tonight, the initiatives wouldn't require under pressure local authorities to fund significant investment or new infrastructure. Often it's affordable, practical, primarily cultural changes that are needed, but they are changes that will help to save lives. Thank you. Christian Allard to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I am delighted that Stuart Stevenson, MSP for Banshire and Buchan Coast, has received cross-party support uh, for this uh, debate uh, today. Uh, the debate titled The Importance of School Bus Safety Around Scotland. Uh, I too, uh, like Mary Scanlon, uh, would like to uh, congratulate Mr. Ron Beatty and, and other colleagues who, who spoke before me. And particularly, I would like, like Mary Scanlon said, uh, saying that the success of, this, of the Scottish Parliament is this petition system, which is uh, a, a best way of, uh, of this access to democracy and making sure that all these issues are not left to politicians, but people uh, like Mr. Ron Beatty can have really an input and can change uh, legislation. Uh, let's remind ourselves that Mr. Beatty first pe petitioned this Parliament on the matter uh, as early as 2005, and it's imperative that recommendations from Transport Scotland had to be carried out across the country. 
I share Mr. Bitti's uh, frustration on that matter, and at the heart of the matter, President Officer, is where is the power lies today uh, to change restriction on bus safety standards. The power, like many of us, is still reserved to Westminster, like Maureen Watt said, and there is a call today that could be made is for this power to be devolved. Uh, we all care about improving school transport safety, but it's where we do it, uh, which is the most important. For example, the EC Directive uh, 2003 20 EC says that buses must be fitted with seat belts, but the directives coming from Europe are only directives. As we know in this matter, it's up to Westminster to make them law. Another example we debated this morning at committee was the lack of devolved power to tackle drink driving. Most of us powers are, are reserved, presenting of a it is slow and cumbersome uh, for us here to increase road safety. If the Parliament uh, today uh, had the intention to uh, increase penalties, uh, penalties for uh, school bus drivers who will be over the drink driving limit, uh, maybe a, a new limit next month, uh, this Parliament will not be able to do it. And I think. Yes, of course. Sir. I just wonder if the member would agree with me that the campaign now running in um, Murray, Grand, uh, Aberdeen City and Shire on uh, Safe Drive, Stay Alive for school children, which is running this week, helps in this area immensely. Chris Nallard. Uh, thank you very much, Maureen Watt. To, to, uh, and uh, Maureen Watt will be pleased to know that I did sign a motion today uh, which uh, uh, celebrates that, that, that event uh, uh, on Monday. And if you can talk about that event, you know, uh, uh, not only it's a fantastic event because all the youngsters from different academies and primaries are going to it, but what's important is when I thought about it, when I saw all this film and all this testimony from people from different uh, emergency services who were trying to uh, and achieving to, to to tell our youngsters our safety is important. I remember when I came into the beach ballroom that there were a line of buses waiting for them to take them back to the academy or to the primary. And I did think, you know, let's make sure that all these buses have got seal belts and now we are happy that they have. And all that safety, it's very, very important that safety it's, it's given to the youngsters as early as possible because we need to have that culture of safety. And that culture of safety is not only for us adults and certainly not, not only for us politicians, but for our youngsters as well to understand from the start. And it makes life a lot easier, make them better driver afterwards and they might not uh, uh, go and, 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 and try to pass a, 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 a school bus stop who will be stopped uh, next to a school. And that's very, very important that uh, we think about that, presiding officer, that uh, our youngsters, safety uh, for our youngsters is an important thing. This safety culture has got to be uh, uh, recognised in this debate. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And I call Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. And uh, I too congratulate Stuart Stevenson on bringing this important debate, children's road safety matters to us all. And road safety in general has particular resonance in the northeast of Scotland. And Ron Beattie uh, is an outstanding example of an active citizen affected by a tragic accident to a child on our roads uh, who has worked tirelessly to reduce the risk to other children of suffering in the way his granddaughter has done. And in that he is not alone as we have already heard, but he has put a particular focus on safety around school buses and highlighted the responsibilities of government at every level. This is not, of course, a matter for this Parliament alone, as we've heard, nor is it uniquely for Scottish ministers. There are responsibilities at both UK and local government levels. And Mr Beattie has indeed, as I understand it, raised petitions both at this Parliament and with the United Kingdom Department for Transport. And he has, of course, lobbied his local council, as well as MPs and MSPs in the North East region. He has put a particular focus on this place and on those who are accountable to this place. And I read his comments in the present journal this morning that Transport Scotland should stop arguing and making excuses uh, for not, not doing more and calling on the Scottish Government to use the powers it has to take this issue forward. But members have been right to emphasise that this is not just an issue for the North East, but there is no doubt that our reg region has a particular issue uh, of danger on our roads. Aberdeenshire has the highest rate of fatal and serious accidents across Scotland, according to Transport Scotland figures for last year published just last month, with more fatal accidents to people of all ages than any other local council area. And the number of accidents specifically involving children on roads across the North East 
that number is also high and the need for action is clear. And local councils in the region are uh, taking these issues seriously. And just yesterday, as we have heard, Aberdeen Community Safety Partnership hosted the 10th uh, Safe Drive Stay Alive event at the Beach Ballroom in Aberdeen, supported by the Police and Fire and Ambulance Services, by NHS Grampian, and by all three councils in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire and Murray. And the pupils and guests, as it was described, were gripped by the testimony of survivors and relatives affected by the impact of accidents. And it seems that the consequences of unsafe behaviours on our roads came across loud and clear to all concerned. Those roadshows are aimed not just at making young people safer and better pedestrians, but also at making them safer and better drivers when they do get behind the wheel. And in the 10 years that Safe Drive Stay Alive has been running, the number of fatal accidents involving young drivers has fallen in the North East to a significant extent, although there is clearly a good deal more to do. We need an equal emphasis, as we've heard today, on making the school bus run safer for all concerned. Transport Scotland's guidance on improving bus safety is certainly helpful. The question today is whether more can be done to ensure its recommendations are implemented in full and across the board. So I hope the Minister can tell us what more he can do in partnership with the powers he has and how he hopes to increase the buy-in of partners across Scotland. Families should not have to worry about whether their child is going to come home safely from school. That is the point of today's debate. Mr Beattie's impatience for further progress deserves a positive response to make his long journey worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Macdonald. Uh, we now move to the wind-up. I call Keith Brown, Minister, up to seven minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'd uh, firstly uh, like to uh, express my gratitude to Stuart Stevenson for bringing this important matter to Parliament today and, of course, as many, I think all members have done, to Ron Beattie, whose uh, tireless commitment to improving the safety of our young people as they travel to and from school, I think, deserves the utmost praise. In fact, wider recognition than it's so far had. Uh, I know there are tragic family circumstances related to his efforts uh, and can only imagine the pain that that's caused. But his tenacity in this area over so many years is an example to us all. And I know that he also speaks uh, campaigns on behalf of uh, Alexander Milne and Robin Oldham mentioned earlier, who died after being struck by cars at ages 12 uh, and 15 when they stepped off school buses in 2008 in Aberdeenshire. Uh, there's no greater responsibility, of course, than the protection of our young people, and Scottish ministers remain unwavering in our endeavours to keep them safe. Uh, reducing the risks to children as they travel between home and the classroom plays a key role in our efforts. Uh, all parents know the natural apprehension which we face when leaving our children in the care of others. However, as we wave our children off to school in the morning, none of us should have to worry that they won't come home safely at the end of the day. And that's why the Scottish Government is taking forward a range of measures to improve safety on dedicated school transport. Thankfully, the risk of children being seriously injured on bus journeys is small, but there is no room for complacency. Uh, ensuring that buses have clear and visible signs which show that they are carrying young people is vital. We have heard reservations from various quarters about the current minimum legal requirement on school bus signs. Uh, now the Scottish Government, just to be clear, agrees that there is room for improvement here, and yet the powers to legislate in this area rest with Westminster and the UK Government, which has refused our request for the devolution of this competence. And that's extremely disappointing, to say the least. Uh, despite that, we won't be sidetracked in our efforts, and Transport Scotland has taken forward a range of measures to promote best practice in this area, encouraging local authorities to embrace high-visibility signage that builds upon those minimum standards. As has been mentioned by members, we have published guidance that not only details the legislative requirements, but encourages local uh, authorities to go further. It encourages local authorities to go further. We're often berated in this chamber for insisting on things with local authorities. What we've done in this case is to encourage them to go further. Uh, but to supplement that best practice guidance, Transport Scotland also ran workshops where further encouragement was given to adopt enhanced signage. Now, uh, Mary Scanlon and Alison McInnes have uh, put a challenge to the Scottish Government to do more, and I accept that, and that's perfectly legitimate. I didn't hear from either of them, though, any uh, insinuation that they would support the further devolution of these powers to Scotland uh, from the Westminster Parliament. I'm happy to give way to them if they want to do so now. But that's what gives us those additional powers to take further measures. I'm not saying there's not more we can do. Happy to discuss it further. In fact, Mr Beatty is here, and uh, through yourself, President Officer, more than happy to meet Mr Beatty again to discuss that, certainly. Yes, 
Uh, I don't have my speech in front of me. I've given it to official report. But I was quoting the foreword from the 2010 report. The devolution settlement is obviously going forward to the Smith Commission. But what you said in 2010 and the promises you made for a consistent approach then stand the same now. The devolution settlement's no different four years later. Minister. I think it's unfortunate that Mary Scanlon has not used her intervention to suggest that she would support the devolution of the powers which I've mentioned, which are crucial to us taking this further, which is, I think is unfortunate. If we had the consensus in the Parliament to do that, then I think it would make a stronger case to the UK Government to devolve those powers. Uh, the powers that we have undertaken and the guidance that we've issued, along with the further encouragement, uh, as I say, are not the final word. We should look to do more, and I accept that. But we will be building on the effective work which has been done in Aberdeenshire, where there has been a successful pilot, which led to the local authority-wide rollout of enhanced signage. And despite the UK government's reluctance to drive forward changes in this area, we are working with local authorities to promote innovative approaches. I think that is the right approach to take. It's envisaged, for example, that the Glasgow pilot will provide a robust analysis helping us to further explore how best to promote and support the implementation of enhanced school bus signs more widely across Scotland. But in addition to signage, we're also driving forward improvements more widely. And you'll be aware that I have announced our intention to bring forward legislation in the next Scottish Parliament to ensure that seat belts are fitted to all dedicated school transport vehicles in Scotland. And somebody raised the question of it may be an Alison McInnes about why 2018. Uh, we did uh, make clear at that time because of the point made by Stuart Stevenson that to vary contracts which are currently in place can be extremely expensive for local authorities. So by giving them that time, which is the same, which, uh, same thing that was done in Wales, in fact, uh, an agreement between local authorities and the Welsh Assembly, you can actually affect those changes when the new contracts come up. For, they shouldn't all have to wait till 2018, but that should be the backstop uh, period which uh, we've mentioned. So that's why we've taken that approach. Certainly. Just a point. In, in the world where uh, commercial operations are under ever greater scrutiny, does he agree that uh, events like this debate and elsewhere can often lead companies to act ahead of legislation and we shouldn't underrate the ability of that to happen? Minister. Indeed. Uh, and also uh, the other point would be that local authorities do have substantial discretion at the current time to insist on those higher standards. But I think, as Alec Rowley said, there are sometimes resource implications uh, for that. I face the same challenges when a council leader myself to reduce the uh, school bus service to the statutory minimum and always refuse that. But there is that question of resources for local authorities. But that important measure in relation to signage will ensure uh, the safety of school children on home to school transport. And we've also set up a, group of, uh, a working group of partners which is actively taking forward discussions to ensure that all those involved are ready for the changes coming into effect. Uh, we are aware that there can be issues with bus operators failing to remove school signs when they're undertaking other journeys without children on board, and that is disappointing. The guidance is clear. Local authorities should make this a condition of contracts with operators. We will continue to work with partners to consider what further action can take, that we can take. And I would repeat my offer to meet again with Mr Beattie, who I've met on a number of occasions when he's come to the Parliament's committees uh, and I acknowledge the work that he's done. And if he's aware of further suggestions which we can take forward with the powers that we have, I'm more than happy to listen to that, or indeed from any of the members who've spoken. It is vital that we promote safety for all of our pupils going to and from school, and that's why we're working to reduce traffic speeds on school routes and around schools. And I think a very balanced uh, um, contribution from Lewis MacDonald acknowledged the fact that different levels of democracy hold different powers in this area, and we do have to try and work together for the common good. But we are working to reduce those traffic speeds to promote risk assess school transport pick-up and uh, drop-off points, encourage the regular review of school travel plans, and promote educational materials that foster road safety behaviour behaviours which can last a lifetime and it's through that comprehensive approach that we can continue to reduce the risks to young people using the roads on their way to school, a goal which all of us in the chamber and beyond I'm sure strive towards. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. That ends uh, Stuart Stevenson's members debate on the importance of bus, school bus safety around Scotland. I now close this meeting.